It's still our key scripture about wisdom, knowledge, and understanding, which are very critical and paramount to, you know, everything or anything you're going to get from God. Once you get knowledge, you must understand that knowledge. Then when you apply what you under, the knowledge you understand rightly, it is called wisdom. So that's what we're going to do here. And I don't know if I've mentioned this in this whole series about um, the, the three things that lead in uh, as part causes of marital collapse. You know, the first, the first reason why marriages fail. It will shock you. The number one reason is finances. Yeah, <laughs> to shock you. Number one reason. Number one reason. Are you guys listening? Number one reason. Marriages fail. Relationships fail all over the world. Is finances. Finances. <laughs> Actually, attention should be given to this more than any other thing. But somehow, we don't really give it. We don't really give it the attention it deserves. We don't. It is the leading cause of marital failure. The leading cause of marital unhappiness is finances. After it now, we start talking about sex. Either, you know, the man having enough or not having enough or not being good in bed or, or the other thing. Or, when we talk about sex, it's actually about infidelity. You know, they say that is that is the reason for marital failure. The first is finances. The second is sex, either infidelity or otherwise. You know, the number three, they say, is in-laws. You know, in-laws, of course, include the... Um, family members. These three things are the leading causes of marital failures. So we are looking at the leading cause of marital failure. We are looking at the, we are looking at, we are looking at the leading cause of marital failure, which is finances today. So I try to speak from my heart yeah, and talk to you about uh, things I know proven that works. You know, the one of the first thing I would like love to say here is that total disclosure. Total disclosure is the way to go. Total disclosure is the way to go. Once both parties have nothing to hide, they are already on the right path when it comes to finances, family finances. Husband, be open to your wife. Let her know everything. Wife, don't believe the myth that every a woman should have some sort of money. They say, ah, mother strained their daughters to have some money that their husbands should not know about. That is a myth. That is one of the things that often cause trouble for you in that house. Ah, every woman should have some money oh, hidden somewhere, kept somewhere oh, that nobody knows about. Oh. This one, don't let, don't let your husband know. Uh, just keep it for safety or for whatever reason they want to give. That is bad advice. That is bad advice. Bad advice. Don't take that advice. You know, Bible still talks about they were naked and not ashamed. Being naked and not ashamed goes to everything, including finances. And like you know, they say that money is the root of all evil. Is that what the Bible says? No. The Bible says that the love of money is the root of evil, of all evil. That means money on its own is not bad. But you need money to survive on earth. It is a critical element for survival here on earth. And for the survival of that marriage, money is, money is also important. But it is when the love of money gets into the mix that it becomes a problem. Money on its own is not bad. The Bible also said that money answered all things. So money on its own is not bad. It's when you not love money more than anything. You put your trust in money instead of putting your trust in God that it becomes a problem. We need to talk about, you know, there's something I wrote here. Yeah, it says that finances has totally caused the wreck, devastated lots of families. So your attitude towards finance is critical. You know, husbands, Husbands don't like it when their wife talk about finances or money. Most husbands get irritated. They don't want to hear it. They get uncomfortable. You know, they keep 
this phase once money is mentioned. It reminds me of what happens in church when the pastor mentions money. Everybody's face changes. But when the pastor is blessing and sharing blessing, everybody's happy. But once money is mentioned, everybody's faces, everybody's face changes. That's the same thing that happens to the husband at home when the wife talks about money. You know, so it is something you need to watch in your relationship. You need to get to a point in your relationship where money, the mention of money, the talk of money, the lack of money, the abundance of money should not affect your attitude towards towards each other. I'll say that again. You get to a point in your relationship in that marriage where the mention, the talk of money, the lack, the abundance of money should not affect your relationship with each other. And you might wonder, ah, Pastor, which one is abundance again? Should everybody be happy when money is too much? I've also seen that abundance of money also causes trouble in a relationship, not just lack. Even abundance, too much money can cause trouble too. So I'm not saying you should not believe for too much money. You should, but you should also learn to manage it. That's why the love of it is the problem, not the, not the having of it that is the problem. So, usually when I talk about finances, when I teach couples about finances, one thing I talk to them about is financial management. Christians everywhere, all over the world, knows that God blesses. We know that God has promised to bless us financially. But one thing believers lack and they are ignorant of is when God blesses us with that money, what to do with that money. And I've also found out that lack, not just in marriage, financial lack, not just in marriage, even in your, in your personal finances, usually boils down to improper management of that money. I also look into the family. I also found that as a reason why a lot of trouble starts off owing to finances. Why finance? Why finances is a huge is a huge um, factor when it comes to marital when it comes to marital problems. Why finance is a huge factor when it comes to marital problems is usually in most cases the absence of the necessary basic skills of financial management. I really tell people that cry and shout that the year ends without them achieving anything. And they'll be like, ah, God didn't really bless us this year. Money, a lot of money did not pass through our hands this year. I really challenge them to keep their tight record for those that are faithful titles. And most of them have come back to say that God has really blessed them well. By the time they went back and they checked their tithe for the year, most of them end up being shocked at the amount of money that passed through their hands. So if it is God blessing or God taking care of us, that one is sure. God does his own part. The problem usually is our part, the natural part of making best use of the money when it comes. And I found that that you cannot make best use of that money without planning. So that's the first thing I'm going to talk to you about today. If you're taking notes, you write it down financial planning the reason why a lot of people don't have money is because they don't plan that's the truth so one of the things i like you guys to note when it comes to finances is contentment no matter what level financially god has blessed you in be content be content you know, there's a popular saying, cut your coat according to your size. I have my own version of it. I have my own version of that saying. I don't say cut your coat according to your size. I say cut your coat on the size. Cut your coat on the size, not according to your size. You know, we have a pop star called Michael Jackson that everything he wears is like on the size. His trousers are not up to the heel, they are a couple of inches away from the heel. Everything he wears is like undersized. 
well because he wants to show show off his uh, crystal socks and all that. But in finances, even the personal finances cut your coat according to your size. When you do a little survey of the richest men in the world or, be, or men of means, one of the things you will notice about them is that they don't live according to their means, they live below their means. I see nations now making progress in the world and uh, that are, you know, getting, that are producing every day more billionaires in the world, like China, India, and all that. One of the things you notice about that nation is like a culture of that nation. If you do business with them, you do business with a Chinese man, or you understand, or you have any affiliation with any Chinese company or India company, or you might have worked in one. One of the things you notice that happen in these companies is that they understand how to manage their costs. It got to a point in uh, companies' profitability, so if you're a consultant, management consultant, that they moved from emphasis on how to make more money into emphasis on cost cutting. And there was a period in the world where there were a lot of measures. No one week or two weeks will pass. You hear one major or the other, two companies merging and all that. Do you know why they are merging? It's because of what a financial principle called synergy. In synergy, one plus one is not two. One plus one could be three, four, five, six, whatever number, depending on what each party is bringing to the table. One of the advantages of merging actually of firms in the same industry is that they tend to reduce their overhead. Let me give you an example. If company A spends $1 million on advert in a fiscal year, company B spends another $1 million in advert in a fiscal year. These are all overheads. When these two companies merge, they will end up spending $1 million or less. And possibly less. Do you know why it's less? They are spending up to $1 million because of this company that they merged with because at that time, this company was a strong competitor. So they had to have, you know, sizable investment in advertising to be able to either secure or gain market share. But when they merge with this, their competitor, you they will not notice that they don't really have any other company that they are, in, in quote, competing with in that industry. So their advert costs will actually reduce from $1 million to something lower. So at the end of the day, not only have they reduced, maintained, co reduced costs, because they told them before, they're spending $1 million. Let's assume they want to spend $1 million again. They have reduced costs, not just by merging as far. Well. You understand what I mean? They have reduced it exponentially. They are even spending lower than they used to spend as independent companies. You know, that is one thing about synergy and coming together. So what I'm saying this is that one of the things, one of the things, one of the hallmark you guys should have, one of the things that, you know, you guys have like a rule that will guide your relationship should be this point. Yes, you know, the, the natural human, you know, drive, you know, a natural human drive is to spend money. You know, once money comes into your hand, you spend it. That is how we think. Ah, a normal person thinks. Oh, I wish I had this car. Once you start earning money that can afford that car, you go and buy the car. Oh, I wish I had this. Once you start earning money that can afford that stuff, you go and buy it. But one of the rules of increasing in wealth is not to buy what you can afford. No. Step below it. You start earning $100,000 a year. You can afford a mid-sized Mercedes. Why don't you just step down maybe to a Toyota or a Ford instead of the Mercedes and save some of that money? So one of the keys to financial prosperity is cut your coat under size, not according to your size. So the Bible calls it contentment. You see that in 1 Timothy 6 verse 6. See, godliness with contentment is great gain. So be content with what you have. Be content with where you are. Just be content. Be happy for it. Paul also says, Some have learned to abound and abase. Don't feel bad when 
things get tight. Just adjust. Have that positive attitude and adjust. So the attitude to finances is very, very, very important. So the first thing I want to talk about, I've said a whole lot in this um, introduction. So the first thing I want to talk about when I talk about uh, this family finance is planning. Plan everything. Don't be an impulsive spender. Plan everything. That is where budget comes in. So on a planning, that's where budget comes in. Budget comes in. That is why a lot of um, you know people that live that live their lives running on a budget will make tremendous success in life. So before I, I give you the indices of the budget, you know, I've talked to you first about contentment, which is living below your means. The second thing I want, I want you to write down. The second thing I want you to write down is try as much as possible to avoid borrowing. As much as possible. In fact, if that money borrowed is not going to be used for investment, don't borrow. Then let me give you an example. Don't borrow to eat. Don't borrow to buy clothes or shoes. No. The only place I would advocate borrowing is if the money being borrowed is going into an investment. I'm going to come to the point of investment. We're going to talk about investment. So, number one, be content. Cut your coat according to your size. Or like I will say, I prefer cut your coat on the size. Number two, avoid borrowing. Totally, if you can. Number three, put God first. In whatever plan you are making, put God first. Let God be number one. Make him the first point of call. The Bible says, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all other things shall be added unto you. Put God first. You will never go wrong putting God first. I'll explain that by the time I start talking about I start talking about the indices I'm going to read out for you. Why is it important to put God first in your family finances? Putting God first ensures increase, ensures God's blessing coming over your family finances. Sorry, when we talk about tight, the Bible says that He rebuked the devourer for your sake. When we talk about first fruit, say when the first is holy, the whole lump will be holy. And when you give God offerings, seed, whatever thing you want to call it, you ensure multiplication. Jesus said, give and it shall be given back unto you. Good measure, pressed down, shaking together. I'll still talk to you about that later. Let me just give you all these points then. We would um, go into details on some things. Now I'll talk about to the husband. Don't rob your wife of her spending power. Don't rob your wife of her spending power. I know families where the woman is just a house housewife, so she depends on the husband for every money she gets. But this man makes sure that his wife is kept under. She will ask for basic things. The man will not provide. When you give me money now, so I'll buy with one. I'll buy, you know, those things women need every month and little, little things that she needs. The man says, I don't have money. It's really funny. Why men do that? Most men do that because they are insecure. Most men do that because they feel when they empower their wives that a woman will go in quote crazy. Doesn't make sense. It's totally insensible. Doesn't make sense in, in any ramification. Most men say, ah, now when they empower their wives, the woman will not be listening to them when they talk. When before he says one or two, the woman will talk to them. Especially if the woman is working, making her, home, her, her own money. A lot of reasons men give. For either stopping their wives from working, and the ones that don't work, the refusal, the refusal of giving them some money that they can use at their own discretion. You know? It doesn't make sense. So please, husbands, don't do that. Let the woman have some money that she can call her own. If she, if she works, let her have control over her money, her pay. Yeah, later on, I'll talk about all that, but... Let her have control over her pay. You do not marry her for her money. Her own money is an addition to the money that is coming into the house. You know, let her have control over her money. Yes, it's a partnership, I know. But the onus lies on the man to provide. And the man should not forget that. Even when he's having down, down time, he should not now keep down, himself down, while he's enjoying 
the money from the wife and the wife is out there slaving. She'll get up. She'll be restless. She won't be comfortable. You know, and all that. Husbands, let your wife have control over her money. If she doesn't have a source of income, give her some money monthly that she can control. Very important. This will also give her, you know, some level of confidence and all that. So, let's look at my budget. First, financial planning. Every home will reduce financial issues if they run with budget. See how you start your financial planning or your budget. The first thing you need to check, the first thing you need to check is what you owe. What you owe. Make a list of everything you owe. And you do this with your spouse. You know, you do this with your spouse. For you guys, it's one of the things you need to do when you have the time, as soon as possible. Maybe when you guys are together before the marriage. Make a list of everything you owe. Basically, see the things you owe. Number one, they say you owe God his tithe. So tithing is what tax is to the government. Tithing is to God what tax is to the government. So tithing should come first. I know that is 10% of your income. Tithe. So after tithe, the second thing is tax. So if your tax is de deducted from source, it solves you a lot of problems. So you don't even need to think about your tax. If not, please make sure you take note of that. Pay your tax. Very important. The next thing are your bills. So in the developed world, your bills are, will I say, you know, sizable. And of course, under bills, we have mortgage if you're living in your house. If you're living in your house, it's rent. Very important. The next bills, you're going to have water bill, light or electricity bill, or gas bill. You take note of them. Your water, rent, your rent, water, gas, electricity bill. Then your phone bill should be noted. Then you have a car that you didn't buy 100%. You write your your car lease or whatever thing you want to call it. The monthly rentals on your car. These are the basic bills. They are basic bills. So you take note of them. Then when the kids start coming, you know, for those that live where you pay school fees, you include just the school fees of your kids. Don't joke with your kids' school fees. You live in a developed country where school fees are free. Beautiful. One of the crazy bills that parents, the husbands and wives are presented with now, especially in Nigeria, is school fees. It's crazy. It's alarming. You know, people pay, people that have two or three kids pay one million on one point. So people pay three million. You know the kind of school they go to every three months. I know a family that spend up to 20 million a year just on school fees. 20 million a year just on school fees is outrageous. Totally outrageous. That is almost a hundred thousand pounds, hundred thousand dollars. You know, totally outrageous. So for some people, school fees are serious bills. So you note that too. And any other bill, I might, I might not have, have uh, written down or, or mentioned. You know, you also write it down. Then after your tithe, your tax, your bills, we will step into the next thing: the basic human wants. There is food or groceries. Food groceries. You know, very important. That comes next after bills. Food groceries. You write that down. Um, clothing. Clothing. You write that down. I think these are the basic, you know, expense heads. Every household should have. You know, so let me take it, let me take it through again. Like I said, Plan it starts with number one, writing down your expenses. You know, and when you write down your expenses, the first thing you need to write are the things you owe. Number one is your tithe. When you write down your expenses, the first expenses or the first list of expenses you need to make are the things you owe. Number one is your tithe. Number two is tax. 
Number three are your bills. Under your bills, we have rent if you don't live in your house or your mortgage if you live in your house. Then you have electricity bill, gas bill, water bill. Then in developed countries, you can add cancel tax. You pay, you pay some level of tax to the cancel, which is like a local government. Those are your bills. These are bills you must pay. You can't run away from those bills. Then after your bills, we'll now take into cognizant other expenses like food, clothing, and entertainment, you know, going out, eating out, going to the cinema. All those things should not be what you just wake up and do. That's what I'm trying to, to explain. It must be planned. It must be planned. Let me re-emphasize re what I said earlier. Don't be an impulsive spender. Please. Don't be an impulsive spender. Whatever money you spend, let the plan be made. Meaning, let money be put out ahead of time for every expense. Once we can inculcate this culture and embark this culture, it will be hard to have financial trouble. Believe me. What causes financial trouble is impulsive spending, reckless spending, and not thinking about the future. When you live in the now without thinking of tomorrow, you will sure have financial problems. Take that from me. Now we are done with our expense. The next thing that should be done, the next thing that you need to now write or take note of is your income. How much does this family make? Your income includes what you earn and what your spouse earns. This must be known. It must be clear. You write it down. So it's like, I don't want to really go into accounting or finances, but usually on the balance sheet, we have two sides. We have the assets, we have the liability. On a simple um, accounting entry or book, if simple bookkeeping, actually, because every family should keep their books. And it's something I usually ad 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 advise that a woman do because women are naturally gifted in this kind of things. They are good managers. They are perfect financial managers. So their wife, I usually advocate, should be the bookkeeper of the family. So you should know and learn how to balance your books. Your books are balanced when the assets and the liability, the expenses and the income balance. Balance. Your book should always, or to the best of your ability, be in black and not in red. When it's in red, that means you're owing money. When it's in red, that means you're spending more than you are earning. Never spend more than you earn. Never spend. Never spend more than you earn. Very important. So, what time you now write the list of your income? You now look at your expense and know if there's a problem anywhere. Are you making less money than you are spending? If you are, you need to look at your expenses and cut the unnecessary things. Cut Excuse me, cut them out totally. All the unnecessary expenses, cut them out. Reduce them as much as possible. Then after all of this is done, there's one critical indice that every family must put out money for every month or whenever any income is made or whenever money enters your hand. You must put some money into this expense, into this, it is what I call savings. Savings. Try to save a percentage of every increase you experience as a family. Every income you make, please try to save. So I'm not going to write this in the order of priority. And I'm saying, and I'm not saying that my own hierarchy is the best, or you know, I'm just trying to help you out. So see what see what budgeting does. Budgeting removes headache. Once money comes in, pass it through your budget. I don't know how many of you have seen a, a fruit cutter. There's all these devices that they used to cut fruit. You get, um, let's say, an apple. You use that device. It has, you know, blades on them. You push it through the apple. It slices the apple into the number of, you know, into, the, into maybe into four, into four quadrants or depending on the number of blades you, you put. You just pull it through. I like I like the one that usually they use for uh, potato. 
Once you slice, you you you, you take off the skin of the potato. You use that device, push it through the, the potato. It cuts, it makes the potato into chips. You know, it cuts it up into beautiful slices that you can fry um, and, and for, that you can use for your french fries. That same way, when the family income comes in, pass the income through this device called the budget. Don't spend one naira until you've passed your income through the budget. What do I mean? I have all my expense, you know, let's say in a month is 1,000 pounds and I make 1,200 pounds. Before I spend the money, I first take out every single expense. I take out my tithe, 120 pounds. I pay my tax or if it has been paid already, fine. I pay my mortgage or my rent. I pay my water bill. I pay my electricity bill. I pay my gas bill. Maybe that month, the companies have not sent the bills to you. What you do is you should have a dedicated account where you take or where you deposit that money. You don't touch it. This account is an account for bills. So you take that exact amount that the bills are supposed to be or you anticipate it's supposed to be. You pay into the account. Don't touch it till the bills come. Then the next thing are the other expenses. Also have a dedicated account for that. You make sure you pay your telephone bills, you pay these other bills, you know, the other expenses. Then you know the amount of money you need to spend on groceries. You know, you put that money aside in an account or you put it aside somewhere else. Let all these expense heads have an account where the money goes through. So once the income comes, the income passes through this account, then what is left should not be saved. Saving is very important. You don't joke with savings. Save. Now, I'm going to try, I'm going to try to give you some percentages that can represent some of these things we've talked about, some of these expense heads and some of these indices of your... They may have some money saved, so they use that money, pay their first rent. And they're like, wow, we have a house now. Not knowing that down the line, they will need to pay their rent for the second year. And when the second year's rent come, they'll start running up and down. And they're wondering why they cannot meet up with paying their rent. Because they paid that first year's rent, they forgot to think about the future. That's like a lot of people run into problems in paying rent. Apart from the part, from the part that they did not plan for it, they did not also put this into consideration. People live in houses that is like 50% of their income. That is outrageous. People live in houses that is like 70% of their income. That is outrageous. You're going to have, they're going to have issues paying that rent. Once your rent is more than 30%, you're going to struggle to pay that rent. So they'll tell you, don't live in a house, don't buy a house that the mortgage will be more than 30% your income. Don't rent a house that they rent with more than 30% your income. So, after tithe, consider your rent. So, I'll write rent. Rent or mortgage, 30%. So, that is 40 already gone. You are left with 60. So, living in a developed country, your, 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 your gas, water, and ener your energy bills, let's just call energy bills. Let me also include telephone and your telephone bills and your TV bills should not also exceed. It is comfortable for it to be. It will be more comfortable if it's at 15% of your income, but it should not exceed 20%. Rent 30, other bills 20%. So we are still using the 120, 1,200 pounds per month um, income. So that means your rent should not be more than 400 pounds. Then at 20%, your other expenses should not be more than 240 pounds. So at this point, we've done 60% and we are left with 40. Now, like I said, you must save. Every income that enters your hand, you must, must, must. If you cannot save, you need to look at your expenses and what you owe and reduce or take away one that is not important. You must save. 
Now, when people talk about savings, they say saving for the rainy day. That is not what I'm teaching. I'm not teaching you to save for the rainy day. No. I'm teaching you to save so you can invest. There's a popular, there's a popular equation in finance called S is equal to I. Meaning savings is equal to investment. That's what I'm teaching you. The money you are saving, you are not saving for the rainy day. The money you are saving, you are saving to invest. Every family at any point in their life should have a project that they are pursuing. You must have a project you are pursuing. Once you don't have a project you are pursuing, you have a high tendency to spend money recklessly. What a project does to your, to your family finance is that it puts you in a straight jacket. Um, projects is like discipline. It helps discipline the family. It helps discipline you so you don't spend frivolously. You don't spend frivolently. It helps dis discipline you. So at every point in your life, pursue a project. You are renting a house. Pursue a project to buy your own house. So that money you're saving, you're actually putting away money to pay the initial deposit for the house. Pursue it. So after your tithe, your rent, your expense, that's your bills, your bills, your important bills, the bills you know you must pay. The next thing is savings. Take out 20% savings. So we have 10% for tithe, 30% for rent or mortgage, 20% for your bills, then another 20% for savings. If 20, excuse me, if 20% for savings is high at the particular point where you are in your finances, 10% will be suffice. But make sure you save. If you can't do 20, which is ideal, do 10. You already have 80%, so you're left with 20. So in this 20 now is where you now is where you now take out money for leisure, for vacation, for you know eating out, for entertainment. But before all of that, I forgot something. Groceries. Groceries should come in. Very important. Groceries should come in. Don't spend more than 10% of your income on, on food. So groceries should be another 10%. Or like I also said, depending on your level of income, you can up it to 15%. Or the size of your family, you can up it to 15%. But don't exceed 20%. From the calculation I've given you now, if you spend 20% on groceries, you will notice you don't have money for entertainment. You can't go to the cinema once a month. You can't even go eat out once a month. So this is all the things you will need to take into cognizance. So, but the basic indices are your tithe, your rent or your mortgage, your bills, savings, savings, then groceries, because you must eat. Before we're not talking about clothes and some of these other, you know, wants and desires. Make sure you handle all these things that have listed out. Very, very, very important. So create a budget. Create a budget. So I'll just run through what I've said. One of the basic principles I talked about at the beginning is contentment. And I, I took it further to talk about living under your means. Don't live according. Live under your means. Very important. Believe and trust God for increase of your income. That is where the first thing you take away in your budget is your tithe. Then you can take it a step further after your tithe. Set apart money for sowing. Because when we look at, look at tithe, the Bible says in that place in Malachi chapter 3, that you have robbed me. He said, where? And the children of Israel asked, where have we robbed you? He told them, in tithes and offerings. And most times we focus on tithes and we don't talk about offerings. Offerings are also very, very important as tithes are. Very important. Very, very important. Because tithes open up the gates, the flood gates. Tithe is your covenant connector. When you pay your tithe, you fulfill your own part of the covenant. The flood gates are open. But when you give an offering, you now qualify for blessings. The Bible says, Jesus says, Give and it shall be given unto you. It is a tight and it shall be given unto you. No, tight is the covenant connector. Tight is what you do to show that you honor God. 
when you go back to that place in Malachi, start from chapter 1. Chapter 1, God was asking you a question. He said, if I be your God, if I be your father, where is my honor? Where is my honor? So tithe. You pay your tithe to honor God. So it's a covenant connector. It's your own part of the covenant. So when you give that, you give God the leverage to open up the floodgates of heaven. But when you don't have seed sown, no blessings will come through. Then you sow seed, but you're not paying your tithe. The blessings will come, but the gate will prevent them from reaching you. It's like you have a landlord you're owing. The man keeps asking for his rent. You keep begging him, say, landlord, please give me another month. I'm going to pay you. The next month comes, goes by, you couldn't pay. They are owing rent up to six months. But at the six months, incidentally, it was December. And you gave your, your, landlord, your, your landlord a Christmas present, beautiful present. You spent so much money. And you gave him the present. Oh, he'll be happy. He will thank you. But that present does not cancel your rent. Because the present is a gift you gave him. Your rent is what you are owing him. So he will collect the gift. He will thank you. He will be appreciative. But he still reminds you, you are owing me. Pay your rent. So don't go giving God offerings. Thinking it can take the place of tithe. There's a doctrine going on now that you should not pay your tithe. Instead, use that tithe money and go and do welfare. Use that tithe money and help those in disarray. Take your tithe to, to orphanages. Take your tithe to the less privileged. No, that is wrong. Tithe is not supposed to be used for that. You pay your tithe. You can't use your tithe at your own discretion. No, you pay your tithe to God. Then you give offerings. Remember, there are two things God talked about there in Malachi. You rob me in tithe and offering. Who are they robbing? God. That also means that offerings also go to God. But the difference between tithe and offerings is that offerings are free will. But tithe is a certain percentage of your income that tells God, I love you. I thank you for giving me the power, energy to work and be, to be paid for this so and so number of days of my life. Thank you for keeping me alive. It is like saying thank you to God. It is God's money he gave you that he's checking your faithfulness of returning a 10% back to him. So that connects you again to the covenant. But your offering is the one you get increased from. So the two of them must go together. So why am I saying this? Depend on your income. I also advocate, I also advise that you have a percentage you set apart. You set apart to sow seeds. Very important. That will help your family income. I'm giving that as the last in DC. You know, as the last in DC. Try as much as possible, periodically, to give some money. And there are different ways of giving. It is this offering now that you can give the less privilege. God, see, just said that any man that gives to the poor has lent to God. The Bible says, when you give to the poor, you lend to God. I imagine when you lend somebody some money, that person is expected to pay back. And the person does not pay back what you lent. The person pays back with interest. So it is that one that you can give the poor, not your tithe. Not your tithe. Yeah, they say yes, but it's in the Bible. And I still tell them, yes, go and go to the Bible. The Bible talks about three kinds of tithes. Three kinds of tithes. In the Old Testament, the Bible talks about three kinds of tithes. So if you want to follow that doctrine, then you must pay 33 and a quarter percent. That was in the Bible. 33 and a quarter percent. So one of that 10 percent, there are three 10 percent, or rather three cents. Three cents. There are three tenths the Bible talks about as tight. So one of those tenths goes to the church for the Levites. The other tenth goes to the less privileged. Then there's a third tenth that you can bring the people together and have a celebration at the temple. So there are three tenths, three of them. If you want to go by that doctrine, if you want to go by that doctrine, then you won't pay 10%, you will pay 30%. Then you can use one of the tenths at your own discretion. So but your 10% tight. Does not go to the less privilege. That one goes to God. Your offerings can go to the less privilege, and as anyhow you want to use it. Okay, I think that's where I'm going to end.
God bless you. Make sure you subscribe to my channel and look at the other, all the masterclasses on relationship that I have. And very soon I'm going to have masterclass on uh, success coming soon. So you make sure you hit me up, subscribe to my channel so you get a notification whenever a new class is uploaded. God bless you.